Well, the wait is over, folks, as the excitement has already begun pre-expansion dropped. As many teams, in preparation of finalizing their protected lists, have made trades, giving us just a taste of what's to come eventually here in free agency. Therefore, we'll be going over a select few trades, or rather, the bigger ones that have recently happened, as I give my thoughts about each one. And of that, here are five recent NHL trades broken down. Pretty much the trade that everyone was talking about amongst the chaos yesterday, and for good reason, as we eventually saw three teams all having a hand in these exchanges. Philadelphia, who has acknowledged their weakness on the back end, made a huge move towards remedying the situation by bringing in a top pairing defenseman in Ryan Ellis. Ellis, who recorded 18 points after 35 games played, can equally play at both sides of the ice, and is most likely going to be complementing Ivan Provorov here next season while contributing to the penalty kill, which has been in need of some improvements. There's no question, our penalty kill has struggled last year. We believe Ryan will help our penalty kill. Chuck Fletcher says. Certainly a player that can shoot the puck and move the puck and help with our transition game, our power play, our overall offensive game, he brings a lot to the table, Fletcher says. Ellis, who is approaching his third year of his eight-year deal valued at $8.65 million AAV, likely has much left to contribute at only 30 years of age. As for what was given up to secure Ellis, Nolan Patrick, and Philip Myers, looking at it, I think this will be benefiting Philly a lot. Not only are they feeling a void as, I mean, they needed someone really to support Ivan Provorov who struggled last season, but they also didn't give up that much really. I mean, as far as actual production value that is. As Patrick, who was initially drafted by the Flyers second overall, greatly regressed on the score sheet last season as he finished with nine points after 52 games played and was demoted to the fourth line. Myers was also not getting a lot of playing time as he was on the bottom pairing and actually outdid Patrick as a defenseman statistically with 11 points in 44 games played. And not only did Fletcher give up barely a thing in comparison here, but the move is going to allow for the Flyers to protect an extra forward as well as it was rumored that James Van Riemsdyk could have been left exposed prior to. Now that brings us to the second part of the deal, or I guess technically another deal. So Patrick becomes a predator for a split second and then gets flipped to Vegas. I think it makes sense for Vegas to try and acquire Patrick out of the sentimentality factor considering that Kelly McCrimmon, the Knights' current GM, actually owned the Brandon Wheat Kings when Patrick was playing for them. Definitely don't see Patrick starting out with Stone and Pacioretty on the first line, but it's something at least, and given his past production and the value of his last contract, which was valued at under $1 million, he should be a pretty cheap player to sign. Compared to Cody Glass, despite being the same age and playing roughly the same minutes, Glass seemed to have a better season between the two last campaign, after notching 10 points in only 27 games played. So... <laughs> This one really hit home for me personally as a Pens fan. I didn't really understand the logic behind accepting the return unless there's something that Dubas potentially promised down the road that we don't know about to Hextall. Because essentially with McCann, you're getting a versatile player who can play at center or wing, who's coming off a fantastic season, the best of his career really, if you consider the point per game average, as McCann recorded 32 points and only 43 games played with the Pens last season. So for Toronto, this was a steal, as Philip Hollander has yet to play in the NHL, and well, a 7th rounder in 2023 doesn't quite appeal to the win now philosophy either. Anyways, I'm not sure if Dubas is viewing McCann as the answer for the second line center role, since Alexander Kerfoot could be selected by Seattle, but regardless, I could see McCann fitting in nicely in that role in the top six, and could develop some great chemistry with William Nylander. I feel like maybe Hextall wanted to get McCann off the books in order to be able to protect other players instead. So this might have been part of it regardless, but Pittsburgh unfortunately takes the L on this one. As the trend seems to be, um, most of if not all these moves are in preparation for Seattle. Therefore, when I initially saw this trade, it seemed to largely make sense for me and benefit both sides. Why? Well, on one side you have the Coyotes, who haven't had much going for them, but have been stacked in the goaltending department. As in, they had Auntie Ranta, Darcy Kemper, and Aiden Hill all occupying the net at one point in time last season. Despite this though, Seattle prompted a move to be made in order to be able to protect Kemper and not lose Hill for potentially nothing, as he was actually one of the goalie picks that would have made sense for the Kraken, according to The Athletic, prior to this trade. 
On the other side, in San Jose, the inverse could be said about the shark's goaltending expertise, as it has been a looming question in the Bay Area for quite some time. Martin Jones has struggled, the Devin Dubnik experiment didn't work out, therefore the fear that they would be exploited for being too equipped in the crease probably was the farthest thing from Doug Wilson's mind, really, in all actuality. Hill, at 25 years of age, has shown much promise as he finished with a .913 save percentage and a 2.74 goals against average after his first 19 games played. Regardless of the fact that Jones could be bought out here shortly, Hill, who will need a new contract prior to, will be an asset to whoever is starting in net for the Sharks next season. This trade kind of just represents or shows how different the status is between these two teams. As in, the New York Islanders' main objective here was to shed some cap space in order to land a top caliber player, most likely while they attempt to make another deep postseason run. While the Coyotes were <laughs> simply willing to take on a $5.5 million cap hit for the next two seasons for some draft picks. Definitely not a knock at the Yotes at all though, I mean a couple second round picks, one for this year and next, isn't bad at all. Given that they had the space honestly, what more could they really have done to secure some picks ahead of the draft? Ladd, who has been brought in most likely to take on a role of mentorship, has experience at being a captain and therefore leading as well. Despite the fact that the 35-year-old was plagued with injuries last season, given that he now has a clean bill of health coming in, he could serve to be valuable not necessarily on the score sheet, but for the intangibles that he'll be bringing on and off the ice to the young core. 